<laughs> hey guys, Pace Morby here. Welcome to the channel. I'm so excited to show you our new 408 unit multifamily acquisition. We paid over a hundred million dollars for this deal and I'm gonna walk you through it. I'm gonna introduce you to my partner, Vina Jetty. We're gonna be buying thousands of multifamily deals all over the country together. And I wanna give you guys a little bit of a insight of where did the deal come from? What are we planning on doing with that deal? And we'll break down how you can invest in multifamily, maybe with us, or how you can go out and do it yourself. So let's go see Vina. Okay, so let's go, let's go to the, maybe, yeah, let's go to the pool. Okay, so I look at, I look at a deal like this and it's interesting like going from single family to multifamily mm -hmm. because most people in single family, we would look at this and we'd go, this is already too cute. Oh, like where's the opportunity for us? Everywhere. I know, so that's what I wanna talk. I wanna talk a little yeah. bit about that because in the single family world, you look at this cute brick, the cute shutters, the yeah. dual pane windows. Yeah. Most of it has a newer roof, really yes. nice looking pool area. Yes. And I'm like, this is done. I mean, we okay, we want to avoid major deferred maintenance like that. Like, I don't want uh -huh. it to be dilapidated, but that's right. because we target class B value add assets. Right. So it's very much in our wheelhouse to have a cute, but inside, there's so much opportunity. Is there an easy way to describe what a B class property is? I mean, I know, yeah. I can tell, I look at a Mercedes yeah. versus a Kia. Yeah. I know the difference between those. I have a Kia's Kia. Kias are class A. I have a, <laughs> Kias, <laughs> they can be though, that's the I thing. Mean, you know I love Kias. So. What's the Kia that just came out? It's not the, is it the Telluride? Telluride, oh, they have like a is, Carnival or something? It's the SUV. I have the Telluride, the SUV. Okay, it's so nice. Jamil yes. almost bought one. He told so, me, we like geeked out So that's over like it. a class, that's like a class A Kia. Yes. Okay, so like. Of the Kia world. I also have a Kia, it's an Optima. That's probably a um, class B. Yes, that's actually really Still good really place. nice. Yes, both Kias, right. but different levels of finish out right. and trip. So this is a class B asset. Yes, so I would say 1980s, 1985 and newer is gonna be more your class B asset until you get to new dev and new construction. Then that in the last five, 10 years, you're maybe in the class A, A Does a class two. A have the ability to go down to a class B and does a class B have the ability to go up to class A? Um, sort of. Uh, but so, not normally. Yeah, usually, so there's two ways you're evaluating classes, right? You're evaluating based on the property itself, but then also the location, Okay. right? So I would say this is like a class B, even a B plus in an A minus A area, which it's is really It's like a Kia want. Optima with leather interior and maybe yes. a sunroof. Yes, <laughs> or that's parked in a luxury garage. There you go, boom. So that's how you look at it. Okay, so you we, we defined classes. This mm -hmm. is a class B, B plus. Yes. Then we you mentioned value add, and mm -hmm. a lot of people, I don't talk about value add on my YouTube channel a lot. Yeah, So. You don't? I mean, that's really what you do when you're flipping a house. I know, but, be, but <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. Single family and multifamily use very different words. True. To say the same thing. The vocabulary is different. Right, like we, we will use the word forced appreciation very rarely, okay. but single family investors are not as, um, I'd say savvy. And I would they don't, say technical. There you go. <laughs> and so what we say is we go, we are gonna fix and flip this house. Yes. Whereas you say forced appreciation or value add. Yes. So you're gonna force appreciation or you're gonna add value to this property by doing what? It depends on each asset, right? So some of the things we might do, we might put granite countertops in, we might put stainless steel in, it may be redoing the roofs. That might be deferred maintenance that we have to do to right. add value. We could also do operational efficiency. So deferred maintenance is different than an upgrade. Correct. So CapEx deferred... and deferred maintenance are separate budgets. Of okay, so CapEx is capital expenditures yeah. and deferred maintenance is? Is systems that, things that need to be replaced like or maintained. Pump. Pool pump. Yes. Pool pumps or are great, like or AC unit. Door HVAC. handles that are broken or yes. ugly or whatever. Exactly. A CapEx would be what? CapEx would be stuff that we're gonna do to improve the property. So Amazing. deferred maintenance is stuff that the seller or the previous owner really should have done, but they didn't prioritize it. Oh, I got a great example. So if, okay. you, if we come over here, okay, and I look at the coping on the pool, mm -hmm. right? The coping on the pool, you see a couple of them have been fixed, Right, and they have like a couple of them that broke and they replaced them with a, mm -hmm. a newer one. Yep. That is deferred, deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance. And so the thing is, is that may not be something we spend dollars on, even though the deferred maintenance is there. So when we sell the property, the buyer might say, oh, why didn't you fix this? So this is deferred maintenance. This is something where people probably run off and they jump into the pool and the kids maybe have chipped that. It's possible. So at some point those things kind of get just repaired and maintained. It's just stuff that happens over time, right? right. Anytime you have use on something, it's going to deteriorate. So eventually. what would be something you would improve in the pool area? Like your from your yes. eyeballs, yep. 
I walk out to the pool, I'm like, damn, we don't have to do any work. <laughs> this is money, let's sell this right now. No, we're gonna come in, we're gonna redo like the pool furniture, spruce it up a little. Okay. Cause part of it too, is you want the tenants that are living here to know there's a new sheriff in town. Right. Right? We care about the community. We care about your experience living here because this is a community. This right. is people's home. It has an ethos to it. And we want to really focus on that because that's how you get the best tenants. Right. You have lower rates of turnover. You have better payment. And those are things that you care about on your bottom line. So your ultimate goal at the end of the day, like when you buy a property and the goal is to say, hey, there's deferred maintenance and there's mm -hmm. some opportunity to value add or yes. add value to the right. property your ultimate goal is to raise the bottom line Correct. of the asset, which is rents. Yes. Like uh, it's well, as simple as that, right? Almost. Rents or add additional income like the parking. Yes, or what else can you do? You can decrease your expenses. Decrease expenses. So, okay, so three things there that are very yes. important. So number one, I wanna raise my rents yes. by adding user experience and maybe renovating the interiors. Renovating the adding interior. Adding the value on the interior. Really making the community Correct. feel more like, wow, I can use this space, yes. right? Things are falling apart. So people, I bought an asset in San Angelo, Texas, 43 mm -hmm. units, smaller yeah. deal. The playground equipment has like, it's rusted out, it's mm -hmm. falling apart. And I'm, I walk out there and I go, when was the last time somebody used this? Yep. And they go, well, most of our tenants don't even know it exists. It's true. Because it hasn't been maintained for so long. I'm like, why don't you just tear it out? And they're like, well, because People keep paying their rent regardless whether we tear this out or not. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so your user experience is going to keep you from being able to raise your rents, right? Yes. And then, but if you- re And retaining good tenants. And you want them to refer their friends and be like, I love living here. Right. Let me tell all my 10 closest friends and who work with me. Apartment <laughs> complexes really do work that way. Yeah, they right? do. Because they they're do. like, I live here, we can hang out. Yep. You, my sister, my brother, whatever, we can all have live in the community and yep. use the pool. Yep. Bring all of our kids together. Yep. So have a barbecue. It does work that way. Yep. Okay, so the goal is raise the rents. Yes. Second. Second is find additional sources of income. Yes. One here being really interesting is that there's that big cinema thing that yep. has like concerts and stuff yep. across the street. So you can charge people to park here. Yes. So that adds money every single month. Yes. And then the third one is cutting expenses. Cutting expenses. Yes. So the previous owner why wouldn't he just be cutting expenses all the time? Do they just get to the point where they're like, oh, we're on autopilot? It could be that, or they may not have the same scale, or they might not have the same access, or they might not be able to negotiate as good of a contract as we can. Uh, and one thing I'll tell you, a lot of people forget about cutting expenses. When you add a dollar of revenue, so either by adding income or increasing rent, you still have expenses against that dollar. So let's say your expense ratio is like 35%, right? You're only realizing 65 cents of that $1. If I cut a contract or an expense by $1, 100% goes to my bottom line. Interesting. So it's almost better to cut expenses, but you're walking that fine line of, you don't want all this deferred maintenance because now you've cut all the expenses. Yeah, because you're like, yeah, you're, it's like a teeter-totter. It's like, if I if I take all my expenses out, yes, my income goes up a little bit, but it's temporary. Right, and then the now property suffers. User experience goes down and people don't want to come in here Correct. and pay more money for rent. Correct. So the other thing that's interesting is, and I do want to hear, I want yeah. to hear what you're going to do here. But what's interesting is that you can't just come into a property like this and go, we're the new owner. Yeah, We're no. going to raise all your rents. <laughs> when do you raise we the try rents? not to do that. So usually we'll do it on renewal. Okay. Um, and we have a business plan in place, right? So before we go and we do a full lease analysis, which means we review the leases, we see, okay, unit 101 is coming available in September. It's unrenovated or it's this floor plan. And we want to take it to this floor plan or we want to do these upgrades. So we know every month how many units are being renovated. So you know, like also option A, the tenant's going to renew. So there's no reason at for us to price. at this price Yes. or option B, they're not going to renew because we're going to raise the price. Correct. And if they don't renew, then we're going to renovate that property Correct. and then put it back on the market. Yes. And we know generally how many tenants are like we have a renewal ratio that we kind of know from all of our assets. So within our portfolio, we know about 57 percent of our tenants are going to renew. Interesting. Yeah. And that'll change as time goes on, because as rents increase, then we might start seeing a drop. And so it's really about controlling it on a month to month basis Yeah. because we want enough vacant units that we can actually renovate and increase rent. But we also don't want to drop occupancy so low that the assets destabilize or Love it. the bank gets mad. Love it. Okay. So I look at this and I'm mm -hmm. like, the only thing I would change maybe is the red. Yep. Cause you know, red was super hot in like 2005, 2010, yep. Yep. 2012. 
Was it hot in 2012? I, I think people still thought it was hot. Okay, fair. Because like what I what I learned is there was a lot of fix and flippers that would watch from the sidelines in 2005, 2002. Oh, and then they do it in 2000. When they finally get into the game, they go, I always wanted a red door. Oh, okay, makes sense. Okay, and we're like, you. yo, you know that's like outdated. Yeah. So I look at the red and I'm like, that's pretty obvious. You could go like to a different paint yeah. color. Is there anything else that you look at at the pool and you're like, I feel like something needs to happen out here? Um, I think the paint is the big one. We usually will come in and pressure wash everything. Okay. That's actually one of the first things we start doing is we pressure wash and get the breezeways really nice. Um, the barbecue area will probably get spruced up a little bit, but really adding some color. Yeah. Uh, and these are small changes. On one of our assets, we actually were able to buy the furniture from a neighboring asset that was selling. Wow. And we bought the furniture from them. We saved a boatload of money and we were able to spruce it up. It looked so nice. So we're always looking for opportunities to save even like a couple of dollars. It's interesting too, because just like if you're a tenant coming mm -hmm. to a property like this, you can drive by an asset like mm -hmm. this and you go, oh, I would live there. Yeah. And so when we were coming here today, yes. I pointed out the neighboring asset. And I was like, oh, that's cute. Yeah. So you've got to do the same thing here where you go, okay, I've got this red brick, yeah. which is always timeless. Yes. But is there something you're thinking maybe you would do to the red brick? Yeah, so we're currently bidding out to see about maybe painting it like it's a, a lot white. of brick. There's it's like a lot of brick. 20 buildings here. Yes. It's a 408 unit deal. Yes. This girl is a baller, dude. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, I have partners that of make course. it all work. Of so. course, I'm a teeny little portion, but she's me got- Me too, just a tiny cog in the wheel. Of course you are, of course. <laughs> um, okay, cool, so you would spruce this up. Yep. What are some other, are we allowed yes. to go through here? Yeah, Okay. we own it. Well, I know, but I, you know, I just don't want to disrupt it. Yeah, anybody. we don't want to disturb tenants because we want them to be happy here. Okay, so the other thing as I look at, at this, I don't see that this would raise the, so this is deferred maintenance. Yeah. But you also might look at this and go, I'm, while we've got that, you're not gonna find a matching piece of tile. So you might go, let's tear this all out, right? No, because no? this isn't really gonna increase my revenue. There you go. So probably not. But look, so if we it had is, so it is... many dollars we could spend, sure, but there's so many bigger fish to fry. Right, I love that. So it's the same thing with single family in that mm -hmm. regard, where it's like, people will go into a single family asset and they'll go overboard, right? Like. Yeah. They don't need to take out the soffit above the cabinets, mm -hmm. but they will. Yeah. And now you've got an extra fifteen hundred dollars, and they're like, "Yeah, but it looks better." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're not going to get the you're appraisers. Not get the ROI not, you're not going to get the ROI. You might feel better about it, but at the end of the day, this is about your investors making money." Yeah, it's not an emotional thing, right? Like it, they always ask me, they're like, "What color do you like?" I'm like, "I like the color that gets me the most rent. Mm. That's my favorite color." So you have to be thinking about it from like you're not living there. Right? You want it to be nice enough that you would live there or that you feel safe being there, but you don't want to be so emotionally attached to something that you can't pivot to what the market calls for. Right. And so like this area, right? Like it's usable, it's okay, but it's dated. It yeah. needs to be spruced up. So we have a CapEx budget to come in, repaint, change out flooring, replace any of the broken equipment that needs to be replaced. So we'll come in and we'll just make this a really nice area for residents to use. Because again, we want that community feel. We want residents to stay here for the long term. The longer they're here, the better they take care of the community. So this is interesting. My wife and I, when we first lived with each other, we went and lived in an apartment. And my main decision was, is their gym nice enough for me to get rid of my gym membership? Mm -hmm. Because that was like 125 bucks a month. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, great. This is going to cost me... I'm gonna save 125, but I'm gonna live in a nicer place that has a gym already. Right. So, so this will raise the rents. Yep. Right, like a gym will yeah, actually raise it'll, rents. It'll raise rents and some things are indirect, right? So right. restriping the parking lot, for example, it doesn't directly say, okay, you're gonna pay $10 more in rent, but what it is gonna do is it's gonna attract the right type of tenant that mm -hmm. can afford to pay $10 more in rent. So it's constantly weighing what the cost is and what the indirect benefit or result is. Interesting. So uh, it's obvious people watching this, you've been in this game for a long time. Mm -hmm. If somebody's young mm -hmm. or it doesn't matter, you could be young. Maybe you're old and you're ready to get into this. There you go. You're, you're sick of working for the boss. You're the sick man. of working for the man. Or the woman. Or the woman. <laughs> um, you're sick of working for them. And so you want to get into multifamily, mm -hmm. but you're like, wow. I know as a single family guy, we've done, I did, before I get in, into single family, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. This is how little I believe in myself. It's scary. I did 7,000 renovations for other people before I ever did one for myself. I'm about to faint. I know. Crazy. crazy. You know why? Because I didn't know one little piece of information. What was that? Where does hard money come from? 
Really? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's crazy to like think didn't about you that. Did you ask the people you were working for? Like they by didn't, flip They didn't 30? want me to know. So they wouldn't tell you? I, it was this, I, how do I keep my thumb on you? How do I control oh. you? I worked for Open Door, OfferPad, Zillow. I was like their big contractor for a long time. And I would do all this. And then I would do other stuff for like single family flippers, <sighs> but nobody wanted me to know. If they were smart, they would have taught you and then partnered with you. I know. And so um, anyway, so <laughs> that little piece of information is sometimes all that people really need mm -hmm. to know to get into the game, yeah. right? So um, what are a couple of ways to get started? I know I could invest. Yes. Right? You could be a With passive investor. So if you have capital and you don't want to know about the ROI on any of these, you could just be a passive investor and find a sponsor. What, what I love about a passive investor on a deal like this is that you actually get a portion of the depreciation, right? Yes. That guy's very tax efficient. If you don't know what depreciation is, it's funny. Like you get to a certain point, and the main thing we care about <laughs> is not even cash flow. We're like, cash flow was cool last year or two years ago. I yeah. don't need cash flow anymore. In fact, cash flow causes a problem for you because now you need to chase more depreciation. Yes. So when you invest in a deal like this, you get you're gonna end up hiring somebody to do a cost seg yes. study, right? We already have, yeah. Oh, you already have. We do that like right out of the gate. We'll do, a, guys, we'll do a whole video. Maybe Vina and I will do a whole um, breakdown of like a cost psych mm -hmm. study on one of our Zooms or something another day. Yeah. We'll bring in a tax expert to do that. There you <laughs> go. There you go. Okay, so um, I know I could invest. Yes. Um, if I want to invest, I just got to find a really good operator, right? Yes. How do I do that? I mean, they know you, so. Well, I know, but like, is there <laughs> uh, is there something that you have as like a gut check? Like, I, I want to know if I'm going to invest in another operator. Yeah. They have, a, let's say, one or two things that really are pet peeves for you watching other operators where you're like, oh, don't invest in people like that. Um, You know, I'm someone that really likes to see what the strategy is and make sure that their vision is aligned with mine. Because the reality is, what makes or breaks a deal as an operator. It's the execution risk that you're taking mm -hmm. on. So I have a list of like 15 questions I like to ask. When I'm an LP in a deal, I ask them the same like 15 questions, kind of understand what their answers are. So the way I look at multifamily investing is like um, horse race, okay? It is mm -hmm. interesting because the horse is the asset. Yes. And but then the, the jockey, jockey matters the most. <laughs> is the operator, right? The jockey is the important one. It's yes. the, who controls the animal. Yeah. It's who has the strategy behind yeah. the scenes that you're not seeing. And it's like, how do we win the race? And so mm -hmm. you as an investor in that horse, you're saying I'm either, people don't know this, but it's not just horse betting. People actually invest in horses yes. and they invest in jockeys yes. and teams. And so people collectively put millions of dollars together to assemble a jockey mm -hmm. and horse team. Yes, there's people that gamble on those things too, but there's people that invest. Yes. And so the asset is the horse mm -hmm. and the operator is the jockey. Yes. And a good operator can take an okay asset and make it a good or decent deal. A terrible operator can take a great asset and totally tank it. So that's why the jockey is almost more important. You got to bet on the asset. jockey. Got to bet on the jockey. Yes. So that's the first way you can get into multifamily yep. investing is find a jockey. Yes. Or that operator might not even have an asset available for you to invest in, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you can't Build maybe a relationship, right? Build a relationship, get on a waiting list mm -hmm. or one of those things. So that's the first way. Mm -hmm. If I want to be the jockey, mm -hmm. so that's I, daunting guys. <laughs> you know, it is until you do it for the first time and then you're like, okay, I kind of get this. The first deal you ever do is the hardest deal. And that's true in any aspect of real estate. It's just people get intimidated by the size of multifamily mm -hmm. assets. And so I always tell people, if you're starting off, the first thing, everything starts and stops with the numbers, right? So knowing and understanding how do the numbers work? What is a pro forma? How do I underwrite? What is underwriting, right? Understanding those things and getting used to seeing those numbers, understanding words like IRR, equity multiple, cash on cash. If Most you, people watching this are like, what'd she say? Did she stutter when she said IRR? <laughs> is she slurring her words? No, guys, that's an acronym that's, that stands for internal rate of return. Yes. Most people don't understand internal rate of return. Basically, it's a metric that measures your return over a certain period of time. Because multifamily is not a, it's not like a fix and flip where guys, no. what we do is in a fix and flip is we buy a single family home, renovate it, throw it on the market. It's typically a six month turnaround time. And for us, we're like, I made 50 grand. Like that's how <laughs> single family investors um, depict their earnings. I made 25 grand. Mm -hmm. Most single family investors are not articulate enough to go, that actually was a 20% cash on cash return. Or that was an infinite return because I didn't use any of my own money. I used private money and hard money. Yep. I had an infinite return. So an IRR helps you gauge your earnings over a long period of time because... Multifamily is long term, right? It's funny because every time I talk to a single family investor, they're like, yeah, this is like a long term investment, right? We underwrite to about a five year hold. 
in the multifamily world, we're actually short-term holders right. because there are some family offices that'll buy and hold for 20 years or 30 years or institutions that'll hold for 10 years. So it just depends on what your business plan is, what your investors are looking for. So your main business model is, I want to buy an asset that, mm -hmm. that has some deferred maintenance, an opportunity for value mm -hmm. add. So we can go in for five years, raise rents over that time yes. period, then exit that deal to yes. a hedge fund yeah, or a REIT. institution, REIT, hedge fund, family office, large family office. And they want something that they don't have to really dick around with, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Some of them do want the value add component. Some of them just want turnkey. So we're looking for that turnkey investor. That's kind of, and generally speaking on value add assets, a lot of times what'll happen is operator will come in, they'll renovate 50% of the units and leave meat on the bone for the next investor. And then the next one might come in and renovate another 20%. So they're continuing to prove out the business model and then selling it to the next investor before it gets a total gut. So uh, an asset like this, do you have a target before you acquire it yeah. of what you're hoping the exit to be? Yeah, so generally for us, we do take it to 100% renovation in our model. Now what's functionally happening in the market today is we're not actually, like we had an asset that was 494 units. We, 101 were renovated when we bought it. So we had 393 left and we renovated 42 before we sold it. But we sold it for above our five year projection and we 1.8 X star investors capital in 18 months. Almost doubling your money in 18 months. So yep. the way I understand IRR mm -hmm. is that if I, if I made 1.8 X yeah. of my investment in 18 months, that's like 180% return in 18 months. Yeah, so it's about a 46, 48% IRR. There you go. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I owned it for 18 months. I'm yes. going to take that return, which was 1.8, which was 180%. Yeah. I'm essentially going to divide it in the time that we held it. Uh, yes, but then you're going to function it. It's basically like the discounted cash flow. It cannot be done Guys, as I'm a mental calculation. You, here's, the, here's the way that multifamily investors work, okay? They go, how do we keep everybody else out of the game? Let's complicate all the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> and let's make sure the math is really hard and you can't compute things in your brain. No, you have to have a spreadsheet. You have to have a spreadsheet. So Excel actually pays us so there that you we go. can I'm just kidding. Okay, so here's here's my thought. If you're if you're just starting out to answer this question for somebody that's like, well, how do I start out? And she mm -hmm. has an answer, great answer. I need to know the numbers. I need mm -hmm. to know how to underwrite an asset. Yes. Most people even hearing those words are like, um what? What? I'm out. I'm out. Okay, well, okay, I understand what that means because I speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but what does that actually mean? Here's here's what I think Vina should be doing personally is I think no, Vina uh, should be a mentor to some degree because I learned so much from Vina. I'm like, if here's what I would do. Here's how I would start. I would go find any multifamily deal that's on LoopNet. Yes, that's where I send people LoopNet because that's Loopnet. where deals go to die, but you can get all the information. <laughs> you can get all the information. You can talk to brokers. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you find an operator that you believe in yes. and you go, hey, what do you think about this deal? I personally think you should have a, a multifamily mentor that you can go onto like a Zoom and say, hey, I looked at this on LoopNet. I know it's probably a bad deal, but I wanna know why it's, it's a, a bad, bad deal. deal. Yeah, really looking at 100 deals, it will help you because you'll start to see trends emerge too. And then you'll start to say like, wait a second, this operator has X amount of dollars for payroll every month that seems really high compared to what I'm seeing. Is there opportunity there for me to cut that expense? Maybe they have one too many employees on the asset and you can reduce that. Or maybe they don't have enough employees and that's why occupancy is suffering. So you can start seeing how all the numbers kind of intertwine with each other and you can find those areas of opportunity to go into an asset. You know how it felt when you guys first learned how to drive a car? Yes. And somebody put you in the driver's seat and you were like, Oh, the gear shifter and the, and the blinker. Uh, oh and my the gosh. Yeah. And then you had to turn the volume down because you couldn't concentrate <laughs> on driving. Multifamily is very similar to that. And what happens is like after you drive a hundred times, mm -hmm. you start with somebody in the passenger seat. You never learn how to drive on your own typically. Yeah. Okay. Unless you're like a hillbilly in Missouri. They probably, their kids at five <laughs> years old, they're driving around. Like uh, the tractors. Exactly. Yeah. So what happens is you start with somebody in the passenger seat mm -hmm. with you, a coach, a mentor, um, maybe an operator that's willing to get on the yeah. phone with you from time to time. I can tell you, I'm not willing to get on the phone <laughs> with you. And I doubt Vina is willing to get on the phone with you unless it's in a group setting. So if you're one of my students or you're mm -hmm. one of Vina's future students, oh, gosh. I'm pushing <laughs> I her. I see what you did there. <laughs> I'm pushing her. If you're one of her future students, I would be getting on a Zoom so that she can teach a group of people 
how good, bad, or indifferent she is towards your deals that you found on LoopNet. Is there another place they could find besides LoopNet? Really making broker contacts, right? So there's a few Loop, big shops. LoopNet is legit. Here's what I love about LoopNet. If I go on Zillow and I'm looking at single family homes, mm -hmm. none of those people pick up their damn phone. No. LoopNet? Brokers, everybody will. It's crazy, dude. Like. You go from a residential agent to a, a, a multifamily broker, oh. they actually pick up the phone. Eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night. Yep. It's just a little bit more intelligent. I'm sorry if you're a residential real estate agent. You you probably suck at your job. I'm very <laughs> sorry. Don't don't put that on Vina's YouTube channel. Just put that on mine. So um, so you essentially start with a passenger when you're learning how to drive, and before long, you're driving and texting and listening to music as loud as no, possible. No, you're not texting when you drive. I'm not. I'm I just saying I know you are. I know you are. But don't do are. it. It's dangerous. That's our PSA. Right. Don't do that. <laughs> but you start doing, you start multitasking. You're eating hamburgers while you're doing. No, don't do any of this. Just this is the worst both, analogy both ever. Both hands on Ten the wheel? and two. Ten and two. Okay. I'm a little I'm bit risky. I'm like a grandma. I'm like eating a burrito while I oh drive. Oh my gosh. So it's the same thing with underwriting a deal in multifamilies that you start and it seems daunting. Mm -hmm. And that's why you need a passenger sitting next to you and helping you out and saying, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is yeah. bad. And then finally they go, whoa, you cut out all the bad. This Now we can start having- This is good. <laughs> this is good. Keep going down yes. that road. And then before long, you're underwriting and looking at deals on your own. Yeah. And that's how you start um, getting into multifamily. Then yeah. if you have a deal, is it smart for me on my first multifamily deal just to bring that to an operator and say- Yes. Okay. Because yes. then that way I don't have to put a management team together. I don't yes. necessarily have to raise all the capital. Yeah. I don't have to know all the legalities because that's, right. I, I'm going to tell you guys the yes. toughest part about multifamily is what? The securities laws. Securities laws. That's my first call. Even to this day, that's my first call is to Nick. I Nick is her mind. securities attorney, yeah. guys. Oh, yeah. My There's attorney. levels to this shit. You don't yeah. even know. Most of you guys are out there saying, I got a, I got a baby mama attorney, right? Like you guys got nope. child support attorneys. No. Nope. No, no, Securities no. attorneys is like 17 levels above that. Yes. And you need to have a really good one that's yes. creative, articulate, and can help you learn. Have you learned much from your attorney? Oh, all the time. Even now? Oh, yeah. Because the securities laws change. Every two days, they're different. Right. And I don't really want to have to know all of the current laws, so I want to pay someone really well mm -hmm. to know all the current laws. And you become friends with them, dude. Like, it, yeah. there's nothing better than having a friend that's an attorney that yeah. you can text. Yes. Do you remember the days when you would like have to set up an appointment to talk to an attorney and now you're like, oh, let me connect you with my attorney th via group text. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different level, right? Right. Once you get there. But tax, legal, you need those people. Right. So um, if you are one of my students, well, Vina and I will bring in a tax specialist to talk about the cost seg study yes. that was done here. Um, and we'll tell you why that's important because a lot of people don't know that sometimes the main reason people invest in multifamily is because they want yeah. the tax savings. Yeah. People are like, wait, I thought it was just cash flow. It's that too. It's tax efficient. That, so really rich people, they don't care about getting like a couple hundred or a thousand bucks a month or even $20,000 a month. It doesn't make a change to their lifestyle. They care about the tax efficiency of these right. investments. And we haven't even touched on 1031 possibilities. 1031. And that's the thing is like, this is a compounding investment. Yeah. Because like, think about the people that invested with Vina on her deal that they had a 1.8 multiplier. Most of those investors, I would imagine, yes. she'll tell you if I'm wrong, probably r rolled into another deal like this or yeah. another deal, right? Yeah, so they got to defer all the capital gains, and now that money's still growing tax deferred. That's amazing. So, you know, rich people say, their saying is, defer, 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 die. That's mm -hmm. like their business plan, because they're going to defer until the estate takes over, and then they have, you know, estate planning to make sure they're mitigating tax burdens. So, if you want to think like the wealthy, you stop thinking about cash flow, which is crazy because I know that's probably not what you teach in your no, single no, family I, stuff, no, right? No, I, I teach people there's six reasons to buy an asset. Okay, there's six reasons. Number one is cash flow when you first start. Yes. yes. Okay, when you first start, you want to make sure it cash flows. Um, but I buy assets a lot of times. It used to be different. My third reason to buy an asset used to be for the depreciation, for the tax benefits. It's now number one. Yeah. But when you first start out, it's cash flow, appreciation, yes. then depreciation, then pay down. Because now somebody else, right? This is the craziest thing. There's 408 units in this building. That means there's 408 units that are crowdsourcing her wealth. That's yeah. crazy. Like, how do you how do you become wealthy? You have 408 people pay down your debt. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. You crowdsource it. So 
and you have someone else to run it so you don't have to manage it. I don't have to answer for leaky toilets. It's or... amazing. So um, that's the pay down portion, right? Somebody else is paying down your debts for you, which is awesome. I had, oh my gosh, I had somebody, a really big influencer the other day. Mm. Sorry, I'm getting wordy here. <laughs> but I had a big influencer, huge in our um, wholesale space. He says, I would never own an asset that has uh, debt against it. Why? Because he says he's a slave to the bank. No, I want all the debt. Give me more debt. In fact, right now, banks aren't giving me enough debt, so right. none of these deals are underwriting. So here's the thing about um, that, is that I, I replied back to him, or I didn't, he didn't say it to me, but I put a thing under his comments and I said, well then by that, he says, you don't own the house because the bank owns the house. I go, mm -hmm. the, okay. b the bank doesn't have the deed. Yeah, they have they have a lien against the You're house. the owner. Yeah. The person who has the deed is the owner of the property. You can refinance, improve, sell, do whatever you want with that. You could torch it down if you really wanted I don't to be think crazy. You can do that. You definitely shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I think um, that's arson territory. <laughs> but here by that argument, I would also say, um, well, then you don't own your property even if you own it cash. You know why? Because you still have to pay property taxes. Mm -hmm. That means the government owns your property? I don't think so, dude. You just these are things that your tenants will pay for on your behalf mm -hmm. and you make a spread. So the fifth reason why you buy a property is leverage because mm -hmm. here's the other mm -hmm. thing. When you go get a loan yep. for a multifamily deal, does your multifamily lender ask you what your net worth is? They do ask me net worth and liquidity to qualify for the loan, but there's something called a KP guarantor or a they'll, they'll come in and they'll guarantee the loan for you. Right. So usually, but they look at their net worth. Yeah. So guess what? When you have equity in a deal like this, mm -hmm. I have, um, like for us, we have a $15 million deal we're getting a loan on right now. Mm -hmm. And they came and they looked at my net worth and they go, oh, we can give you the loan. We don't have to have an outside guarantor. We can actually give you yeah. the loan because they looked not at cash in my bank. No. They looked at the equity in my deals as leverage to give a loan on another deal. Yes. Because it's part of my, my net worth, right? So that's the fifth reason. And the sixth reason do you know what it is? I don't know. Nobody knows what it is. Generational wealth. No. The story. Oh, you know I wasn't going to know that I know. One. I knew she wasn't. <laughs> so the re like if you're doing YouTube content and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, the reason why you buy a deal like this is like, we own a 408 unit, $100 million deal, right? Or whatever it is. And that story, people go, how? What? Who? When? How? Who? All those kind of things is a big deal for us because we want people like you to invest in deals with us. Yeah, that's the whole reason I do this is just for social media content. Now. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> her, her sixth reason is her actually her first reason. So um, if you're just starting out, that's the great thing is like you just find a deal. Yeah. You find an operator. Yeah. Is there a place that you can find operators or is it just going on LoopNet and seeing people that are operators? No, so LoopNet won't really have operators as much. You might find like mom and pop or like small family offices that own it. Uh, but I would say in a lot of these like networking groups, a lot of us will speak at conferences. That's really the best place to meet. And also join Vina's non-existent, but in the future will exist <laughs> multifamily mentorship. I, this girl, I think, should be the number one multifamily educator. And for me, like when I have a question, voice memo, I get an answer. Text, I get an answer. If I was in a group setting with her, watching other people bring bad deals to the table, she goes, no, it's not a good deal because of this, 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 and this. You're going to learn more that way than you ever will on YouTube, reading a book, or even going to a seminar. Yeah. Personally. I, I agree. I mean, because you're getting tangible experience in that regard. So right. I'll give you that point, but I'm still staying firm over here right now. Okay, great. <laughs> you're um, working on it. <laughs> so we, we got, we're going to wrap up here in a second, but as we walk back. Can I go see one of the other income items? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. I want to know what else are we spending money on? Yeah. Just... Okay, so this here. Oh, cool. Oh. Package room. This is sick. Yeah. So this is like one of those Ama Amazon It's things? like an Amazon package locker. There's a bunch of different companies that do it now. Um, they just come and they give you like a code and send you a text and you can come and you can like open locker 21 and get your packages because in high density properties like this. You see people trying to get yeah. into here? Yeah, and so, you know, we'll have someone come by. We just took this property over, so we haven't had all the maintenance done. But basically, they put the package in here. You can come in, you open it, you get your package. It's secure. Because on high-density properties, theft is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your neighbor sees something, they might take it, or delivery to the wrong address. And also, 
they really hate delivering straight to the door because it, there's so many units. It could take them 15 minutes to go from one side to the other. So it's efficient. I literally was just thinking, why would you have this when you could just deliver to the door? Yeah, no. But then they, it sits on the door yeah. step for two minutes and somebody yeah. walks by and picks it up. It could. Or um, saving time. Saving time. A lot of companies just won't deliver to apartment units. Um, and then a lot of apartment complexes, they don't want to accept all your packages. What if you order a hundred things? Or like Christmas, imagine like- it, That's exactly how when it becomes an issue. And so that's, that's not what fair. solve this problem. It's not fair to the girls in the office to like package delivery people. So guys, we're gonna have another uh, YouTube video, part two of this, and it'll actually be a full walkthrough of the property. We have a good portion of our investors are here for the day. We've had them come in from all over. Everywhere. Everywhere. And we had dinner last night in Char downtown Charlotte. Yes. That was great. It was so delicious. You had, she had a wheat beer. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you don't know what a wheat beer is. I don't know what a wheat beer is. Uh, well, it's the best kind of beer there is. So she had a wheat beer. I had some Diet Coke. We had a great time. Yeah, you and were wild with your I Diet was Coke. wild. So um, we're going to do a walkthrough of the property, show you guys a little bit more. There's a unit that is... Are we walking through one unit or two units today? We'll walk through the model. Okay, the model. Which is like the half upgrade, and we'll talk about all the details then, and then we'll walk through another vacant unit. Amazing. So guys, join us in part two of this where we walk through the actual asset and talk to the investors. You might even hear the investors have a couple of questions right. that I haven't had. So we'll see you guys in that video.